Um, I, Albert Camus, the great philosopher, um, said that everything I learned about morality and the obligations of men, I learned from soccer. <laughs> when I was young, I wanted to be a professional soccer player. Um, I grew up in Miramar in Wellington, which is now very famous because of the film industry, but when I was growing up there, it was a fertile breeding ground for soccer players. We had um, Miramar Rangers was a long established club and right across the road from where I lived was Miramar Park where Winton Rufa learned to become the, one of the greatest strikers of his generation and Simon Elliott learned the skills that would give him a stellar career in America in the Premier League to name drop but a couple of people. <laughs> um, but when I was growing up the people that I was playing with in my age group um, were people like Leo Bertos and Chris Killen who are both now all whites and everything that they learned about scoring goals, they learned from beating me. Because <laughs> like Camus, I was a goalkeeper. Um, I lived and breathed the game. The problem that I had was I was in very good teams, and that meant that I didn't get to see much of the ball. So um, I very eagerly responded to um, an advertisement or a notice that I found about specialist goalkeeper training out in Petone. Um, once and I, w I went out there, and the course was run by this fellow called Grant Williams, who was a, a coach with huge pedigree in the game. Um, he had uh, a record of taking talented goalkeepers and making them to all whites. They had Barry Pickering was on a, uh, a biscuit tin when he went to the 1981 World Cup, and another of Grant's protégés was the third keeper when New Zealand went to the most recent World Cup. Um, so I tried out um, and did a bit of stuff and basically said, I would like to, to work with you more. Um, and Grant said, my friend, you have hands like a digital clock but I think you've got potential. So he took me on, and this was great. Grant Williams had been a massive coach um, in the late 70s when New Zealand was inching up to the World Cup. He was coach of Stop Out, which is this beautifully named club in Upper Hutt, and it's named after Stop Outs at the time were street kids, and Stop Out was a collection point. We'd collect them in and give them something good to do, and they went from that to a national force in soccer under Grant. Um, so I started taking the train out to Batoni, training with the men's first team, becoming better and better. I was, when I wasn't training, I was playing twice a week, once on Saturday and once for reps. When I wasn't playing, I was watching football on TV, I was watching it um, at the parks, at Miramar Rangers, I was a ball boy, I would go along and watch a club game and when I wasn't watching it, I'd be talking about it. And often I would talk with Grant, we had very lengthy phone conversations. He was basically the best pedagogue that I've ever been involved with in all my years of education. He had brilliant stories, pedagogue of course, being child teacher. <laughs> um, he had these great stories, but they were always totally focused. They weren't old man's ramble, they were focused on the point he was trying to illuminate um, or something that was there to help you. And eventually, uh, Grant's associate, he, what he looked like, he was a big fat dude who wore a limited variety of track suits. <laughs> He had a baseball, you know, he'd wear a baseball cap and he chain smoked Winfields, which was totally common at the time. The, the whole league was sponsored by these people. Grant was quite old, he was retired, he did everything that he did for free, um, and he went beyond football. Like, there was, um, we trained a little group of us, and it's a story in itself, but one of the kids was having an awful time at home, and Grant actually took him in as a lodger. Like, he was a, a very good man. And the club started noticing that we suddenly had a whole lot of really good young players. So they put Grant in charge of the under-19 side for this tournament up in Napier and packed us off. They hadn't even been able to field a side before that, but Grant was this talent magnet. And we went to, I'm not sure what Napier is like now, because uh, I've totally lost track of football, but um, at the time it's this big tournament around Labour weekends, the best of the best. It was a, a huge thing to do. Our team, we had um, Jamie Smith up front, who three years earlier, we were all 15, 16, he had been the first person to make his full debut for an adult team, definitely in New Zealand, maybe in the world. Andy Barron was in the midfield, he was the only amateur player at the 2010 World Cup, he took the field against Italy. Sasha Nathu, play anywhere, um, he later became the goalkeeper for the famous Under-17 World Cup um, that was held in New Zealand. And Grant treated us like absolute professionals and we we gave it back, you know, we, it's three games a day, three 40 minute games over three days, semis, finals, in between, we were warming up, warming down, in between games we'd be going back to the hotel to rest, to eat the proper food, at night all the other teams would be drinking and this kind of thing, we'd be around these really intense whiteboard sessions plotting <laughs> our tactics, and we came third, 
And it was, it made the local papers. It was so astounding because Tony hadn't even fielded teams who were beating the best of them. I was a player of the match in one of the things and just missed out on a tournament team. And the great thing about it was we knew that we had two more years to win this thing. So I came back, I was doing school C that year, I did that and then I went overseas. And I came back and the first person on the phone that I rang was Grant. It's like, when are we starting? We've got to, we're going to win this thing this year. This is a big year for me if I want to turn pro at what I was doing. And Grant said to me, I'm sorry, mate, I have retired. Um, it's my health. I'm too old. I just can't handle it anymore. And I didn't think any of those things were true. And I said, look, Grant, I can kind of understand if you don't want to handle the team, but perhaps we could do our one-on-ones. As, as we'd be, mate, I'm sorry, I, I just can't do it anymore. Um, and I lived in Miramar, and everyone, everyone was happening in Matoni, and I didn't really want to hear. So stuff kind of started leaking to me um, fairly slowly. But the first thing I heard was that a 30-year-old, based on this paper thing that had come out, a 30-year-old man had approached the club and told them that Grant had interfered with him um, as a young player at the club. And there were aspects of it. He didn't want to take it to court, but he just wanted to make sure that Grant was never in charge of a football team again. Um, and that, I felt there were aspects of that story that didn't quite check out, especially the thing about him not wanting to take it to court. But soon after it did go to court and um, more people came forward and in the end Grant was convicted of sex offences against young boys um, in his charge over the course of 30 years from the late 60s uh, right up to 1990. Um, he didn't help himself at his trial. He said that he was sorry if he'd caused any hurt to these boys, but um, he really didn't think it had done him any harm. He was, it came out that when he was young, he had been a, uh, a male prostitute in Upper Hutt. He was one of these stopouts for which they'd formed the eponymous club. And he looked like, I, I could, this is a man we'd had in our house that I'd talked. Uh, I loved this man. And then he, there he was leering out in the paper. They'd, framed him just perfectly, looked like a stereotypical pedophile. Um, he was sentenced to four years in prison there. That's around the time I started losing touch with football. I, I played one more tournament the next year as the under-19s, but it wasn't really the same. The, the coaches were these, they didn't live and breathe football, they were these social dudes who were helping the club out through a difficult time. And on the van ride up, they were talking about the whorehouses they were going to visit now that they were away from their wives and children. And, in the, after the games, they, um, they bought us beer. So I have never played football since then. I watch it very occasionally. I, I catch it on the news and stuff. But it was that quote from Albert Camus, everything that I know about morality and the obligations of men I learned from football. I feel that football has taught me everything that I'll never understand. <laughs>